intern. But the special part about that job is that I found an opportunity to actually become a program manager because of some of the gaps that they needed to fill and the skills that I had to fill those gaps. So the great thing about being in a public health space, especially an organization where you know you can bring your skill sets, is that if they have the funding and if you can identify where you are best suited, they'll most likely have an opportunity for you to be fit at, especially if you can articulate those skills and prove that you can actually use those to better better perform in their programming. And so that's exactly what I did. I was able to go from intern to like quickly become a manager and actually cover the grant that they were um, using in um, in HIV with women. So it was a great job and I worked. Welcome to Public Health Careers. In today's episode, we'll hear more about finding your why in public health, the importance of negotiating for schools and in the job market, as well as the value we get from building on skills and experiences early in your career. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you stay up to date with the content. Leave a five-star review, a like, and share this with someone who will get some value for it. There's also a link below if you want to support the platform by buying me a coffee. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Christy Sproul. I am a thought leader and public health strategist, and you are listening to Public Health Careers. Today, we have an enthusiastic public health advocate and practitioner whose experiences are centered on using social justice frameworks to address health inequities in under, underrepresented populations. She got a bachelor's in health sciences, community health at California State University, Dominguez Hills, then got a master of public health at University of Arizona. She currently works as the community impact director at the American Heart Association and Urban Leaders Fellow at the Urban Leaders Fellowship, while currently pursuing a doctor of public health at the University of Georgia. We have Christy Sproul, MPH, M M MPH Chess. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Amari. Really happy to be here and happy Monday to you. Happy Monday to you as well. And I'm glad to have you on and excited to hear more about your story and the insights that you have to share for everyone listening. Uh, so tell us, how do you identify and how you do it? Um, so I'm Christy. I identify as a Black woman, a public health professional and practitioner, a beautiful daughter, um, a beautiful sister to many of my girlfriends, and someone who is extremely passionate about allowing the opportunities for people to be their best selves and optimize their health in every way possible. Love it, love it. Well, thank you for in introducing yourself. Um, and I know that you 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 really have an interest in in sharing like why how can people find their interest in public health so can you talk more about finding your why in public health yeah so finding your why is first identifying your who um and i really emphasize who you are as an individual is where you will really thrive in public health right um i am not a numbers girl necessarily. So I wouldn't thrive being a biostatistician. Um, I'm a talker. I'm a connector. I'm a communicator. And so knowing who I was in my natural space allowed me to really understand who I can be in the public health field. And so with that, I think the first step is just identifying your strengths and identifying who you are outside of public health. Who are you with your friends, with your family? Um, what do you naturally do well? And so all those elements can really help to drive some of the opportunities that you'll see in public health. Um, so like I mentioned, knowing that I'm a communicator, a connector, a strategist, um, big energy, all these different pieces naturally, I put myself in public health spaces that allow my strengths to be um, highlighted and shined upon. And so I've done a lot of different <laughs> jobs in public health. And now I really feel confident in where I'm going in a career in public health. And so um, sometimes you have to take a few jobs before you feel confident in your career. And even in your career, you will consistently pivot, but you at least have a path that you feel comfortable um, being in, in alignment with. And so that's where I feel like I am right now at 30. That's, that's perfect. And listening to, to that, I think 
I advise people a lot of times like choose a direction of, of where you want to go and like figure out the path from there. But you have to have like that that goal in mind going forward. But to that point of like knowing your why is like digging deeper to understand what kind of person are you? Do you like like independent work? Do you do you like being around people and interacting with people and trying to put yourself into those kind of positions so that you are building on your strengths as opposed to like maybe trying to work from a place of more deficit, which might isn't a bad thing necessarily, but I think just playing into your strengths and what you like is is an easy way to continue to stay motivated or e- more easily stay motivated. So so I appreciate that. And then on that end, what does public health mean to you? Hey y'all, you may be looking for ways to show support for public health, health equity, and this platform, the Public Health Millennial. Well, head over to my shop at thephmillennial.com forward slash shop to buy and support if this show has helped you. Also, use the code podcast for 20% off your next order. Link is in the description to the shop. Be sure to tag me on Instagram at thephmillennial. Thank you. I look forward to sharing your pick. Now back to the show. Public health is community in action. So... When you look at all of the planning and the processing of having a health related idea, like I want healthy food in my community. It takes community to act on those types of strategies. It takes coalitions and community organizations and leaders who believe in your mission to drive it forward. But it starts with community. It starts with understanding what the community needs are and being intentional and walking in those spaces and asking questions and not asking questions because you are an expert and already know the answer, but asking questions because you really want to gain knowledge and you really want to understand the people that you're working with. So for me, public health is all about community and connectivity. Um, Without those two, public health would just be another medical clinic or another surgeon performing um, in their operation room. The, the difference to me between medicine and public health is that public health is active in its movement with community. Um, we need medical homes, but we also need community to facilitate some of these processes that we see in our health strategies work. And so without community, a lot of this would not be moving in the ways in which we need to. So it's all about community. It's all about the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I think like a lot of people listening to this would definitely resonate with that. And just understanding that uh, a lot of the times we have to be actively listening to what community is saying, what community is needing, and not trying to like put our thoughts or perspectives on what the solutions are for the things that are mostly affecting them. Um, so yeah, I yeah, completely agree with that. And then jumping into your collegiate story here. So you got your Bachelor's of Health Science at the California State University, Dominguez Hills. So what was the thought process going into undergrad? So actually, when I started my undergrad career, um, I started Howard University and I wanted to be a nurse. You know, I, I knew I wanted to be in the healthcare field, but I wasn't sure what that looked like. And so I would ask my dad and, you know, he went to law school. He knows the college life. And, you know, he was like, well, if you like healthcare, you should be a nurse. They make good money, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I like money. I mean, I didn't know at 18, anything outside (laughs) of, I want a good career. I want to be happy and I want to work with people in healthcare. And of course I want to get paid. So I started off with nursing and then I hit biology and ochem and microbio. And I realized very quickly that there might be other people better for this job. (laughs) Um, And I probably could have slaved through it. And I probably could have taken my talents to the phlebotomy chair and did all the pokes and sticks and the intake. But I truly felt like there was something more not only in my academic studies, but just in my personality and in my journey that still needed to be in health, but maybe not in nursing. And that actually solidified for me because when I went to Howard, I did one year and I ended up coming back to California because it was more financially smart to come back home because I'm from LA. I'm from Inglewood, California. Shout out to the wood. Um, And so when I came back home, I went to a junior college for two years, El Camino College in Torrance, California. And while I was doing that, I was taking a lot of behavioral science classes, health science related courses. 
And then I transferred into Cal State Dominguez Hills. And I quickly gained a lot of skills when I was in my actual bachelor's program. But while I was at um, El Camino getting my associate's degree, I was also doing a lot of internships and and just gaining experience on the ground. So I was always that kind of person, you know, for me, academia was never enough. I needed to get out there, in there and figure out how this makes sense in the real world. And so while I was at El Camino doing an internship at UCLA's Ronald Reagan Medical Center, I did some rotations. I worked with a couple of nurses. I did um, rotations in the OB department, in uh, med surge, in a lot of post-op uh, rooms, uh, ER rooms. And I just felt like there was something more for me outside of the four walls of a hospital. And mind you, at the time, I was like 21. I didn't realize that even in the medical field, it's so diverse, right? In my mind, it was doctor, nurse, surgeon, maybe some techs. Like I still wasn't even then as privy to some of the operations in the hospital setting and outpatient setting. But at the time, when, when, when I went through those rotations, I just felt like there was more for me. And so another thing I did to really solidify my stamp in public health was talk to people who were in the field. And so I started to gain mentors while I was at Dominguez Hills. Um, I was a McNair Scholar. McNair Scholars are um, undergrad students who want to matriculate to a PhD program or a doctorate program. And they give you all the skills, tools, and knowledge to do so. And so we had a lot of research projects. We were gaining a lot of mentors. And through the McNair program, I quickly learned that one, I need mentors because they... I mean, they know a lot about the world that I was trying to get into. And number two, I quickly realized, well, let me, let me, let me go back really quick. Before I even entered Dominguez Hills to pick a major, I was like, I don't, I want to be in health sciences, but I don't know, like, what's the career plan for that? I was able to talk to some mentors and they were like, you sound like you want to go into public health. You know, because I was telling them, like, I want to educate people. I love community. I love seeing change happen in, in front of me. I love being a part of that process, like all the things. And they were like, yeah, you sound like, it, that sounds like public health. And I'm like, the health of what public? Who's public? What is this? Like, <laughs> so I, I did the first time at like around 2021 hearing this term, did some research and realized, yep, I want to be in public health. This is, this is what I need. So fast forward, going into Dominguez Hills, becoming a McNair Scholar, doing research, connecting with mentors, having internships, I realized more and more that public health was a way for me to really be successful in a career. And so um, from 2014 to 2016, I was at Dominguez Hills. I graduated my bachelor's in health sciences with a community health option. Um in 2016 at Dominguez and full speed ahead from there. Yeah, I well, appreciate you sharing that. And I think that tells volumes about like just, just what we were talking about, like having that direction of wanting to do health stuff, but not really knowing what there was in this health realm. And then knowing that you want to be in community and you want to do these kind of things. And then like in speaking to professors, they were able to say, okay, there is this thing called public health. Um, and I, I guess, like, to that point, when when did you find out about public health? And then second question is, like, what was the impetus for getting the McNair scholarship? And, like, what, was it getting a PhD something that you knew from that point going forward? Like, how do you decide that? You know, it's interesting. I always knew I was a scholar. So that part of my personality, I knew. I knew I was always an intellect. I was very inquisitive all the time. I had questions for everything. I loved research, diving into things. So I I wouldn't say coming out of high school that I knew I wanted to be a doctor, but I did know I wanted to be a scholar. And so I knew that college was going to be in me and on me for a while. Um, but when I was presented the opportunity to be a McNair scholar, it was actually my friend who was in one of my health sciences classes at the time. And she was like, I think I'm gonna apply for this McNair thing. You should do it with me. 
So at first it was just like, a, let me see if I can get in with a good friend of mine. This will be fun. And then when I actually start to interview and shout out to, uh, shout out to Michelle, uh, Dr. Uh, Martinez, who is amazing. And um, she interviewed me and I realized that I'm actually cut out for not only the McNair program, but really anything within the collegiate space that I'm presented with, because I'm just such a scholar. Like it's just, it's really in me to be of excellence. And so I, I would say actually from the application and the interview and actually getting in the McNair program is when I really told myself that I can go all the way. And um, I didn't know the timeline of that. I didn't know what that came with, but I just knew in that moment that I actually could go all the way. Because at first it was just, like I said, me applying with a friend and, you know, get into another program and seeing how it goes and having a good time in the, in the process. But once I actually got in and realized the magnitude of the McNair program and how we are so... Um, Academically, we are so sound in a lot of the work we do and the connectivity we have. I was like, yeah, I, I can definitely be a doctor. Um, and I think um, once I talked to people about public health, it really rang for me the idea of being a health educator, because I felt like that for me was the foundation of a lot of my work. Now, I realized in public health that you could do a lot more than health education. But at the time, once I heard health education, once I heard being an educator, once I heard community, all these words that resonated with me, that really set the tone for how I wanted to structure my career. And considering public health had all those elements, it was just a good fit. That's great. I mean, so important to focus on like that exposure and the experience because like to that point of like maybe you not even realizing that becoming a doctor was a thing that you can do in an academic sense and just like shout out to your friends, shout out to having friends who like push you to do things that you never know where they'll yes. take you, but like shout out to your friend able to yeah. get that that shout scholarship to and then from that like, be yeah. <laughs> shout out to Christina and then and then be in that space so like really see that okay I can do everything in this academic space like if I wanted to and I think that that is very very important I just said to, to to point in it so the first time you heard about public health was from your professors or was there a time prior to that that you learned about um actually it was from a nurse so when I was doing rotations uh at UCLA's Ronald Reagan Center I would be honest in asking nurses like hey, do you like your job? Like, do you enjoy this? Like, what what are the Good elements questions. of nursing that you enjoy? I mean, because people fall into careers and, you know, sometimes they probably could have done something else, but they're in the career and they learn to love it in some capacity. Um, so I remember talking to a nurse and she was like, honestly, it's a lot of hours. Um, it's a lot of interfacing with patients. And it's not always the rosy way that we see on scrubs or general hospital. I mean, there's real life scenarios that you really have to be equipped to handle um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, nursing has flexibility. But when I started to describe to her the kind of things that I wanted in my career, that's when she said, you know what? It sounds like you want to be in public health. And she told me, she was like, there's public health nurses. Like, if you still want to have a little bit of both, you could. And I was like, um, well, I was, I was, I was, I'm like, well, honestly, I didn't even pass my microbial class. So I might just want to stick to public health. <laughs> she was like, yeah, you might want to. Um, and she was real funny. But, but it's true. I mean, I think that my pivot was quick and it was intentional because I knew that instead of suffering through something, I could optimize in another area. And so I quickly was able to move into a different space. Yeah, that's kind of self-awareness that we kind of need in life. And and to your point of like pivoting is like going on a direction and then realizing, okay, this is something else that I can do. And I have like the passion skill sets to, to be able to build that out. Okay. Um, 
So you graduated from your undergrad program and you became a program manager at the Power Source Tucson. Um, so t tell me how you come across that and then what do you do in that position? Yeah, so kind of staying on the academic journey. Um, 2016, I graduated from Dominguez Hills. I entered straight into a master's of public health program at the University of Arizona. So it's interesting so, how- yeah tell, yeah, tell us that thought process actually. What, yes, what, what yes. Was the, what, yeah. So it's interesting how U of A actually became a part of my career. Um, so as a McNair scholar, we have mentors, we have support to apply to an array of programs around the country. And so that's what I did. I applied everywhere and everywhere outside of California. Cause I was like, I've been in Cali all my life at that point. I was like 23. <laughs> I was like, it's time to shake it off. You know I mean? I could always visit again, but I, I really wanted to explore and, and step out of my bounds. And so I applied to uh, Louisiana state. I applied to university of Birmingham and Alabama. I applied to St. Louis University. I applied to U of A, uh, University of Arizona. And there was a fifth one. I applied to five schools. And then I applied to, ugh, it's not coming to me, but I got into all the schools. So it was, it was dope. It was like, ooh, I get to choose. Now, mind you, as I was choosing, I had to think strategy again, because it's not about the bells and whistles of a school. It's about where you're going to thrive at a school. And so... Prior to making my decision, I reflected on a summer experience that I had. So as a McNair Scholar, one of our summers as a student, we um, are challenged to go to another university and do a research program. Because usually a lot, of a lot of universities, they'll bring in bachelor students and have them do different exposure experiences and research. University of Arizona had one. And I got in and that was 2015, summer of 2015. And so it was called UROC, the um, Universities Research Opportunities Consortium. Yeah, so the UROC program. So if anybody wants to apply for summer research programs, I'm your, if you want to do anything in public health, I'm your girl, honestly. But shout out to me if you need some help through that. So as I was able to be accepted and go through that process of the research program. I also learned a lot about the University of Arizona. Um, I learned that it was hot. I learned that it was a lot of cacti. I learned that it rained every other day in July, uh, AKA monsoon season. But outside of those pieces, I also learned that University of Arizona is actually a really good school and it's a research one institution, which I didn't really know if that meant anything at the time, but as I was matriculating at the U of A, I realized how important that is to really have a strong research portfolio and being an R1 school, they allow those opportunities. So fast forward, after my summer 2015, I did the Yurok experience. Now it's time to pick schools. So as I was looking through schools, first thing I looked at was who gonna give me some money? <laughs> Cause black girl from Cali, Parents are middle class, doing good with their lives, but they definitely don't have $50,000 lying around for my school. So I had to be strategic in the money. And so I started to negotiate, you know, say, hey, I'm a smart black McNair. Y'all might want to, you know, get some get some monies rolling. Y'all might, you know, and I didn't, I didn't say it as foolish as that, but you have to be strategic and negotiate when you want to get into schools because like anything else, they're looking for the top candidates and if you believe you are one of those people, you can negotiate different strategies around your uh, schooling. So um, the only two that were even hearing me when it came to money was University of Birmingham in Alabama and University of Arizona. University of Birmingham was still a little too expensive because they didn't offer as much as U of A did. U of A not only offered me a stipend, but they offered me a teaching assistantship, TA, right? So I was able to teach, which I love doing, gather more research experiences from the professors I'll be around and get paid for it. Win, win, win. So, and I already had experience going there and I made friends there. And I actually, while I was in the summer program, I made a good girlfriend who ended up being my roommate for the next two years of my master's program. And we're still besties to this day. Shout out to Maria. 
So um, all that to say that you'd be surprised where your experiences land, because if anybody were to ask me when I started in Cali, if I was going to ever end up in Arizona doing anything, <laughs> the answer would have been no, because all you have to say is heat. And I would have stayed clear far from that space. Um, not a heat gal. <laughs> um, but I gained so much experience from being at the U of A, including finding an opportunity to work at power source. So the unique space with power source is before I actually started August, 2016 at the university of Arizona, I needed a job. Now my job already had the stipend, but I'm a little greedy and I'm an overachiever. So I thought, let me see what other opportunities in Tucson where U of A is at. Let me see what other opportunities are presenting. And so I did research, I, I did some cold calls and I came across this nonprofit who was looking for interns um, and paying them a, a pretty good stipend. And so I interviewed and I got the job. And so I was able to come right into Arizona with two sources of income lined up. And I, it, it was, it was amazing. Right. But it was all strategy. You got to plan accordingly and strategize as you go. So with that, I was able to land um, a job at power source as an intern. But the special part about that job is that I found the opportunity to actually become a program manager because of some of the gaps that they needed to fill and the skills that I had to fill those gaps. So the great thing about being in a public health space, especially an organization where you know you can bring your skill sets, is that if they have the funding and if you can identify where you are best suited, they'll most likely have an opportunity for you to be fit at, especially if you can articulate those skills and prove that you can actually use those to better better perform in their programming. And so that's exactly what I did. I was able to go from interns, like quickly become a manager and actually cover the grant that they were um, using in, um, in HIV with women. So it was a great job. And I worked um, about a year and a half with them doing an array of deliverables, but it was fun work. And it was all about just seeing what was out there and, and being strategic about it. Oh, wow. That, that, thank you for walking us through that. And I think people would be upset with me if I didn't ask you, what was your process for negotiating with schooling and what advice you could give someone who is trying to negotiate with schooling right now? I think I appreciate you sharing that and that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think the progression of you into your master's degree made a lot of sense. And I love the part on negotiating schooling as well as how you took this internship and really put, put yourself in a space where you can advocate for the manager position as opposed to just an intern and then coming into schooling with both that stipend and this manager position is probably a good feeling for yourself. But I know people would be upset if I didn't ask, what was that, that process? Could you like negotiating schooling and what advice would you give to people who are, who are thinking about doing that? Money? Is it a stipend opportunity? Is it full tuition? Is it, okay, I'll work for you as a research assistant or a teacher assistant? Is it, okay, I can have a free room and board, what's the negotiation and what's going to work best for you? I would always advise that first you will want to talk to a financial advisor who can best help in understanding what opportunities that the school can actually provide, right? Because you don't want to walk in there saying, all right, if y'all don't give me full tuition, I'm out, you know, because you don't know what capacity they have. You don't really understand where they're at in their financial uh, budgeting. So especially because they are accepting hundreds of thousands of students every year, both grad and undergrad. So yes, you're the prize, but you're the prize out of thousands of students. So you also have to be realistic in what you're asking for. But if you are that 4.0, like creme de la creme type of student, yeah, you could probably go in with, asking about those things. And sometimes they'll even offer it to you without you asking, like they'll put in the, the admissions email, you know, 
because of your academic scholarship, we're going to offer you this amount of money, this opportunity. And then from there, you can negotiate even further. Like, I see you offered me 20000 Could I have 20000 and an assistantship or 20000 and a stipend or 20000 plus room and board? Or so, so if they already offered you something, you already have a really good lead in to asking for more opportunity. If they haven't offered you anything, the best question is, what opportunities do you have for incoming students for financial for financial gain? Do you have any research or teaching assistant opportunities? Here's my resume. I, because through my experiences, I would love to contribute to either or. Are there any graduate assistantships that I can uh, partner with? Um, are there any professors doing research that have grants that I could be a part of? So some of these questions are going to help in seeing what opportunities a school has and where you would best be seated at. Um, when I was offered a teaching assistantship at the time, one of the PhD students was graduating and then I was able to sit in as a master's student and, and help uh, co-teach one of those courses. And so sometimes it's about the alignment. Sometimes it just happens to be you are the best student sitting in that seat at the right time and you could slide in really well. Um, sometimes it is negotiation and going back and forth. I will say, though, to bounce some ideas off of a mentor, a financial advisor at the school, or even an admissions advisor, because they'll be honest with you and you don't have to feel like you have to come in as your perfect self. They're there to advise. And so if you really do have candid questions like, hey, I really want to go to this school, but how can I afford it? Do you see any opportunities where there's availability for um, financial gain. You can ask those questions candidly to financial advisors or admissions advisors, especially if you've already got it in. Um, but if you're still scouting, like if you're maybe a sophomore, junior in your bachelor's program and you're looking for opportunities in grad school, you can even cold call and, and, and call some advisors and say, hey, I'm thinking about going here. I have this GPA. I'm interested in this kind of work. Where do you see myself sitting on the financial table? Are there any opportunities that I could be presented? And so, um, and then maybe who do I need to network with now? Like if there's a professor that got this huge NIH grant and I'm already a junior, but I'm about to graduate in two years, maybe I can be a mentee to one of those professors and begin to build a relationship. So by the time I graduate, I'm already sitting in the seat to be an RA. So there's different things you can do, and there's a lot of strategies around the game, but I think that it's about knowing your positionality for your student portfolio. Like for me, I had about a 3.6 GPA when I graduated from Dominguez Hills. Um, I was a McNair scholar, so I had really good research experience. Um, I was a teacher, just I was a preschool teacher, but I also taught like you know, educator classes and different things through my internships. So I had teaching experience um, from a range of all ages. And I just had the swag and the personality and, and the charisma, you know, just in general to be, walk into these spaces and be successful. And so knowing all those pieces in my portfolio, I was able to negotiate that way. Um, I didn't use my GPA as a negotiation piece because I'm like, 3.6, it's good, but people were knocking over on f with 3.8s and above. So I couldn't really use that for my strategy. So I used my other strengths as a baseline to really get in the door. And whatever strength you have, really lean into that. And I think that that's going to be the best placement for your opportunities. You really laid out an uh, entire playbook that people can use. And uh, I really thank you for that because that is helpful. <laughs> and I think Pay a, lot me. Might, no. <laughs> a lot of people might... <laughs> hey, put put your cash up underneath. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I think a, a lot of people don't even know that that they can negotiate these things, or they don't they don't know what are the questions to ask. And, and I think like really how you laid out going to the financial advisor, reaching out to people beforehand, looking to see which professors are getting big grants to see if if you can network with them to build relationships to so work on those kind of grants and really putting yourself in positions um so so that that is some awesome advice and, and I, I highly recommend anyone that is thinking about the mph program or any other kind of program to to really advocate for yourself and know know what you're bringing to the table and share how you can leverage that to maybe get some sort of your schooling paid for some some sort of opportunity totally agreed yeah the advocating for yourself is is a critical component 
because really it is you versus you in this whole process. You will have support, you will have the, the tools, you will gain knowledge, but you're in the driver's seat the entire time. And so you also would want to remember that as a student, you're paying for these experiences, whether you're getting assistance from a college or whether you're actually going to be using loans or your own money to pay for this experience. So anything I'm paying for, I'm going to get everything from that experience because money is a valuable asset. And so considering that I'm also a valuable asset, I want to make sure that everything is smooth. Even the professors, even the college experience, even the culture, you want to make sure that as a student, you are confident and comfortable the entire way through. And that's not everybody's story. Like I've, you know, while going to U of A, it is a PWI, a, pre a predominantly white institution. And so as a black student, it, it takes a little bit of, of, of grinding gears, um, and not necessarily the neck rolling and the eye popping and the typical, you know, uh, aggressiveness that some people perceive black, black women to be. It's more so presenting and asserting yourself in spaces to help people understand that you, amongst everyone else, is just as qualified to be here or else you would have been somewhere else. And so creating that level of... Um, presentation for yourself and allowing others to see that in you, um, it also holds a high regard for how you're going to move in those academic spaces, especially if you're a person of color, um, really understanding that if you're going to a PWI, how do you find community? How do you still uh, rely on your culture and your being? How do you create a level of comfortability? And how do you gain um a, a relationship with professors because that's going to be in life too. Academia really sets you up for your career placements as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like being, building intentionality into the things you're doing. And then for, your, for yourself, Christy, during your master's, master's degree, you were a community planner, Pima County Community Development and Neighborhood Conversation, Conservation, a health prevention specialist, specialist at the University of Arizona Campus Health, and a research assistant at the University of Arizona. Do you want to talk more about those experiences and just touch a little bit on what you and then just to talk a little bit about the opportunities that you, the experiences, I should say, that you had during your master's in the public health program a little bit. So you were community planner at Pima, or Pima, Pima County, County Community Development and Neighborhood Conservation, a health prevention specialist at the University of Arizona Campus Health, and a research assistant at the University of Arizona. So you can just talk a little bit about those experiences. Sure. So... The summary of all those experiences is that I needed to jump around and I needed to really understand the different spaces in public health that I can thrive in. Um, some would find jumping around unorthodox and not um, the, you know, a, a strategy of longevity. But I think at the beginning of your career, it is fair and it is actually beneficial to understand and jump around and see what works especially because I was in academia, I had more of the freedom to look into different spaces and places in public health and practice in different fields and see what fit and what stuck. So um, as I was a program court, a program manager at PowerSource, because the hours were about maybe five to 10 a week, I could use my time in other spaces as well. So I was able to, and mind you, this is the overachiever talking. Like, you really have to know who you are as, as, as a person and a professional. Like, for some of my friends, they're like, you have two jobs and you teach and you go to school, what? So for me, that was natural and doable. For others, it could have been a nervous break it, breakdown. So I think it's important to know your temperament in these spaces and what you can handle. Um, knowing my, my level of, of competence in, in a lot of these spaces, I knew that I could handle it and wanted to explore a lot more. Um, so with that being said, I was able to look into other spaces and 
I did a six month internship with Pima County as a, um, um, I forgot what the title was. I, I know it was um, something to do with like prevention. Community and, planner. Yes, community planner. Yes. So <laughs> with the community planner job, that was six months. And, and the cool thing about public health too is that you can gain experience in a short amount of time. So you don't have to stay like committed in a job. Sometimes there's fellowships or different opportunities that are seven weeks, maybe three months, six months. So you can still get a lot of experience without it seeming like you're jumping around. And so that was my strategy is finding those jobs that had spurts of time that I could really gain knowledge and move on. And so when I found the community planner position, it was great because I was able to work on a grant that looked at homelessness in women and understanding the landscape of Pima County and what kind of partners need to be at the table in order to really help put funding and resources toward helping homeless women. And so that was a great experience. And I gained a lot of knowledge, a lot of, in, a lot of networks. And then from there, I found another six month opportunity to work as a prevention specialist at the U of, U of A um, in their campus health department. And that was probably the best job I had prior to the job I have now. No shade, because I loved all my jobs. But it was just the community of intelligence that was that was in the room. I mean, we talked through all of the strategies of how to optimize um, students' health and their experiences. I mean, we got granular. Like we got into the weeds of how we could really work toward these outcomes. Um, as a prevention specialist, I specifically worked on the AOD grant, alcohol and other drugs that they had, the grant that they had. And I helped develop the workshops. I helped to provide the education and the communications and marketing around how we can help students with um, engaging in alcohol and other drugs. Um, because we have to be realistic knowing it's a college campus U of A is a college town in Tucson, Arizona. It's pretty small, party city. And so we had to really understand how we can allow students to have their fun, but in an engaged and in a healthy way. And so we provide a lot of education and marketing around those pieces. Uh, we also offer diversion classes. So if a student was caught drinking, excessively or under 21 or caught with some type of substance, we didn't want to send them to the wolves. We want to bring them in, educate them and really help them find a game plan for some cessation, some cessation um, uh, resources. And so uh, I helped to kind of develop those programs and things like that. But the cool thing about that job is that everyone in that workspace was just so woke in the public health world. I mean, we just had so much to talk about. We had so much strategy around our, uh, you know, what we wanted to see for students. And they were just some really great people over there. I mean, shout out to the health department, the health, uh, I'm always shouting out, but I love to shout out because people need their flowers, um, to the Student Health Center at the U of A because they were just such cool people to work with and they were just so intelligent and um, so warm. And so that work environment was not only amazing to just be in, but the work was fun too. And as a student, I, I learned so much. Um, and so I had a couple of jobs while I was at the U of A, now that I think about it, when I, I had the program manager job, I had the community planning job, and I had the prevention specialist job, and I was teaching as a teaching assistant. Um, so I did a lot, but I needed to do a lot. I think I wouldn't know what I wanted to do in public health if, if I didn't try a lot of things. I didn't want to be fixed in a position in public health. I wanted fluidity in public health. That was my plan for my career. Now, I didn't really know what that meant at the time because, you know, 24, 25, I'm just having a good old time and taking classes and doing my thing and meeting friends. But I just always knew that as a person, you know, outside of my career, I just love fluidity. I love flexibility. I like to jump in different spaces and places and try things out. Um, I'm a very experiential person. And so, um, 
knowing that about my personality, it wasn't a surprise that I would do the same type of, uh, of space of, of pieces in my professional work too. So U of A was a good two years for me. And then, um, after I graduated in 2018, that's when I took my first big girl job as a research coordinator at the U of A. So, um, from 2018 to 2019. Um, so I worked there for about a year and a half. I worked as a research assistant, uh, for a program called the all of us research program, which is a nationally funded program through the NIH. And so the goal was to enroll 1 million Americans into a study where they would give, um, health related data, uh, through surveys and through biospecimens. And so um, for those who are interested, the program is still going on. I'm a participant as well. Um, I'm an advocate for the program and it's doing amazing things. But I did that for a year and a half. And it's interesting because I did all this work at public health just to get my first job drawing blood and, and doing surveys for participants. <laughs> and I was thinking, uh, this ain't quite what I, I mean, I thought I was going to step into like director of health equity of the, the national association of like, I thought I was going to be that girl. And <laughs> mind you, I was still always that girl. I'm always going to be that girl, but I needed to really still get my feet wet in the professional world. Cause I didn't have academia backing me up no more. I was MPH certified. I was in the world. I was not cushioned by college. I was a professional at that point. Um, but I was able to network really well. And I do want to say this for people who uh, don't want to take gaps because I, I don't really like gaps outside the one in my mouth. I ain't going to lie to y'all. I, I gaps, <laughs> I, I, unless it's a gap in research I'm trying to find, I'm good with that gap, but I wasn't really privy on taking a break. Um, and that's just me. You know, some people need it totally fine. I just thought for me, I wanted to go from graduation day to my first day at work. Like I didn't want no time spared. I really wanted to get to the money and get to the work. And so, um, as I was in my final semester of my MPH program spring, I started talking to folks, same, same strategies that I've always been using, networking, talking to folks, seeing what's out there, seeing what jobs are circulating, looking at um, the careers page at U of A. Cause I, I, I knew that I was still going to be lingering around Tucson for a little bit longer. I didn't really have a game plan of jumping ship too soon. Um, and luckily I was able to buy a home because I had the monies because I was graduated in, in, in the workforce. And so I stayed for a little while just to kind of, you know, get my bearings. But in my spring semester, as I was finishing up my thesis and doing all the things, I still was looking for a job. And so I graduated in May and I started in June and it was all because of how I've been navigating my work the whole time, always being one ahead of the game. And so once I entered my job, June of 2018, as a research coordinator, I worked for about a year and a half for the All of Us program. I was able to buy my first home and it really helped to set the stage of how I can start to articulate my skills and what I was really gaining from being a research coordinator. Because at first, I didn't really know <laughs> how I ended up, you know, being a phlebotomist, taking blood, taking urine, doing surveys that just, that just didn't sound like public health to I mean, at first, like I didn't understand what I was really doing or learning at the time. I just knew that the check was coming in. I was a working girl and I was living my best life, but I realized that it was still all the same skills, communication, connectivity, being, be, being able to connect with different programs, connect resources. It was all the same work, right? And that's when I realized that public health is really in every space that we're in. I think that's when I start to connect the dots that no matter what job I have, public health is going to be somewhere in that space because there's always a community involved. There's always a connectivity piece involved and there's always an education component. And so even in the research job, all those elements were still there. And so I was still doing public health, even in the midst of 
collecting pea cups and drawing blood. So, um, so with that, I um, jumped into the Atlanta world, and I'll get into that. But yeah, that was it was an interesting journey in, in Tucson for sure. Yeah, absolutely, and I appreciate you sharing like. Early in your career, you, you made the choice to like jump around to jobs to really ensure that you're building out your skill sets as well as like getting a better understanding of what you want to do in the field. And um, awesome that you're able to get this job with all of us. I, I know that all of us research and I know like they popped up when, um, what's the name of that that app? Uh, the one that you, you talk, what is, it, what is it called? Clubhouse, oh Clubhouse. I was about to say, there's so many. <laughs> and, 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 and there was, the, yeah, the clubhouse was the first one. And there's like a big discussion on like the public health space around all of us research and people having a lot of discussions about like, is this something that is for, for black people? Is it like helpful to black people, et cetera, et cetera. So definitely very familiar uh, about, about that. And yeah, also advocate for it because I think like large scale data, health equity, you need data to say like, okay, whatever we're doing is improving for these populations. Um, so yeah, I will link that in the description for anyone interested as well. But okay, so talking about your, your shift into the Atlanta market, you you came from from Arizona to Atlanta to become a clinical research coordinator too at, at Emory University. So talk more about that and what you did. Yeah, so jumping ship, I knew Tucson was not gonna be home. It was cute. It was a great three years, but I'm a big city girl. Like being from LA, going to a cute little college town like Tucson, it was time. It, you know, after my, after, you know, about a year and a half uh, at the U of A doing research uh, with all of us, I was actively applying for about three to four months and was able to land an Emory University job. Now, the great thing about it is I was negotiating again because I was like, hey, I'm moving cross country. Can I get a few more weeks and just two? <laughs> um, I can be, arrive at this date. I will start Monday. Like, I'm ready to go. I just need to actually get there. Um, so I was telling my new manager that and, you know, they were really flexible and really uh, open to just you know, my journey to Atlanta. And so I packed everything. I had a little U-Haul hitch on the back of my uh, Toyota RAV4. Um, I'm an only child. So, you know, my parents were retired. They had nothing better to do. So uh, I got them in the car with me and uh, we drove cross country um, and I ended up in Atlanta. So um, I ended up working as a clinical research coordinator too. So it was a, a bit more, uh, technical than just the research coordinator position because outside of all of the medical elements, there was some um, treatment plans that I was a part of facilitating and communicating back to the patients. So at Emory University, there is um, a, a, an agency called Winship Cancer Institute. Um, it's a really great cancer institute that provides education, and treatment planning for cancer patients. And so I worked in the head and neck department as a clinical research coordinator. And that job entailed me build, helping the clinician build out a treatment plan based on the clinical trial that the cancer patient was on. So we helped to consent the patient in the clinical trial. We'll first educate them to see if it was a good fit, but also consent them help them with their planning process because on the clinical trial, there are certain checkpoints that you have to meet in order to stay on the trial. And um, clinical trials are, to me, really progressive and amazing and really help to frame science to the next generation. Um, so I do encourage people, especially people of color, um, to participate in clinical research. And I understand, trust me, the boundaries and the oppressiveness that comes that came with in history um clinical research but the progressiveness of what's happening now it, it's it's very amazing and i think all of us is a great place to start if, if anyone's interested but for me working in the cancer institute was very eye-opening the patients are just incredibly humble and beautiful to work with and it was a great experience for me to really understand 
treatment plans. And it also helped me understand project plan, because if you think about it, meeting certain checkpoints and having everything lined up is project planning. It's project managing. And so that's an element of public health. That's something that public health professionals do all the time. And so even in clinical research, I'm still optimizing my skills in public health. And so that's the great thing about public health is that you're always finding ways of building a skill set in any job you have. And so I did that for 10 months. And then um, I had uh, another opportunity present itself to me after that. So, um, but it was a great, it was a great experience. How, how, and, and how, how did that next opportunity present itself to you? So um, I, when, when I got to Atlanta, I started to network quickly. Like I use, I'm telling you, same strategy. Nothing is changing. The, the wheel is not reinvented. It's the same stuff I've been doing since 21. Um, and so I started to talk to people and start to gain new mentors. And um, I could put a little tidbit quickly on finding a mentor. So LinkedIn is your best friend, if you don't know that by now. Um I start to type in public health professionals, health equity specialists, ex, you know, uh, just all these titles in, in my search, um, in my area. And I started to talk to a lot of people and see who's a good fit for me. Um, now my mentors, some of them didn't last forever. Some of them I still have, but I think the whole point is to network and see who you can just talk to 30 minute call quick cup of coffee, whatever you need to do to network and get the kind of information you need and to share information too, because it's about the relationship. So when I got to Atlanta, I did just that. And so as I was working at Emory, I was still talking to some people about just what's out here in Atlanta. This is the public health hub. So I was like, I know there's some movement, some movement going on. Where do I need to be at? Um, Because much as I did love clinical research, I wanted to really get into more public health opportunities. Um, and so one of my, uh, associates sent me a link for a new job that came up at Fulton County Board of Health. And that was a senior health educator position. And I was like, Ooh, that's in my bag. Health education. There we go. So I was like, I'm definitely applying, um, was able to be accepted. And I worked there for a while about, uh, 11, about almost a year, about 11 months. And so that was an amazing experience. It was super fun. Um, I worked on their um, TPP grant, Teen Pregnancy Prevention Grant under the Health and Human Services um, agenda. And so I was a sex educator and it was super cool to build out an implementation plan for the program, um, build out the workshops of how we were gonna teach the students in the Metro Atlanta area and really just develop a system of how we were going to optimize all the deliverables we needed for this grant to be executed. Um, I had a, I had great managers who I still know, and I actually saw them at a conference recently. Um, and and so the the I, I will say too, as you're moving into different positions, keep that energy alive. You never know where you're going to see them again. Try your best not to burn any bridges. If you're going to move, especially because I moved quickly in my careers. I mean, I stayed for about six to 10 months, maybe a year before I moved into another career. So I I didn't have like the longevity of some people who are in a career for five, six years. I, I kept it moving, you know, and I was able to communicate because um, you always have that question in interviews. What made you leave? Well, what makes you what makes you want to work here? What makes you left? Why are you leaving your last position? Right. And my answer is always, I want to learn more. I love the position I had before, but I also know the skill sets that I'm seeking to gain now and the leadership abilities that I want to experience in my career at this stage in my life. And so with this job being a good fit and knowing all of the requirements, I feel like I'm a great candidate considering what is of uh, what is asked of me in this role. And so you got to finesse and dress everything that you do because you really want to explain well and articulate well your skill sets and why you are a best fit for that position. Um, so I say all that to say that I was um, in that job for about 10 months and um, I was learning more about being a health educator, 
um, and actually developing an implementation plan. So that was like my first time leading the implementation piece of a project. And I loved it. I was like, ooh, this is cool stuff. I can actually see the work happening, excuse me, right in front of my eyes. Like this is very interactive for me. So implementation science is something that um, I really do enjoy and want to gain a lot more expertise in. Yeah, that's awesome. And then after this position, you had uh, two fellowships. So one as a health equity fellow at the University of Georgia College of Public Health, and another as an Urban Leaders Fellow at the Urban Leaders Fellowship. So tell us more awesome about those experiences. Sure. So <laughs> 2021. Um, let's see. After being a senior health educator, I, again, I was like, Mario, I keep eating the mushroom. I still want to level up. So I found another opportunity at the American Heart Association. They were opening a community impact director position. And I was like, director? Ooh, am I ready to be a director? I don't, what am I directing? Who, oh, what does that mean? Like all the imposter syndromes, all the intrusive thoughts. But then I realized I'm that girl. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to apply. Because the worst they could tell me is no. And then I apply to other places and spaces. But it's interesting. I applied for that job. Went through the interview process. I was knocking heads. I felt like I was getting it in. It was, it was wonderful. And then there was silence after a few weeks. I'm like, oh, I don't think I got this job. I, I emailed the recruiter and they were like, um, yeah, we sought out another candidate. And I was like, okay, no sweat. You know, I wasn't meant to have the job. Literally a week later, the recruiter emailed me again and said, the person wasn't quite a good fit. We would love to extend you the offer. And I was like, oh, well, my hand is out. I'm ready for an extension. Yes. But it goes to show that if you are meant for something, you will have it. It just might be, it might not be in the timing you want. It might not be the way you saw it, but I I was supposed to be in this position and I'm still in this position. It's been about a year and a half, almost two years. And I love this job. This is hands down one the best job I've ever had. And I see myself being here for um, a long time um, until I'm Mario and I mushroom level up again. But all in all, this has been a great opportunity. And so I say that to say that I got that opportunity in 2021, August, Yes, August 2021, I started at American Heart Association as a community impact director. December 2021, right? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So as I I applied, that's what I did. I applied for University of Air, of University of Georgia for my doctorate degree in 2020, right? So I'm we deep in COVID. We're all thinking a lot, we're all isolated. And the only thing I could think about is I got to get back in school. Like I got to, I got to hold to the McNair scholars way. I got to get my, I got to get my doctorate. I got to, I got to stop playing. I can't put it off. Um, especially because it was in me to do it. Now for some people, people thrive having their MPH, people thrive having their bachelors. But for me, because I'm a scholar, I needed to be in a place of scholarship. And so knowing that I um, applied in the midst of COVID to the University of Georgia in the DRPH program, and then got in the following year and, and started in August, 2021. So I was starting a new job and I was starting in school and it was crazy, but it was so cool. And, um, then that spring of 2022, I applied to be a health fellow at the University of Georgia and got in. And so for six months, I was able to work alongside some stakeholders in Albany, Georgia, so South Georgia, and um, work on their health communication plan for vaccine um, hesitancy and helping more people become um um, vaccinated during the pandemic. And so that was a really cool experience. And, um, I was able to really optimize my work and my academic space 
to work in this fellowship. And um, the constant question I get is, how do you do it all? And I don't have an answer for (laughs) y'all outside of God, good coffee, and um, extremely dedicated time management. So um, with all those pieces put in place, it was, it was really great. And from there, I obviously couldn't stop. I needed more. <laughs> and so after the Health Equity Fellowship in the spring of 2022, there was an opportunity that presented for a summer fellowship at the Urban Leaders Fellowship. Um, it's a national fellowship that helps fellows in understanding health policy. And so I was accepted that summer and did a summer fellowship with them, with urban leaders. And so um, fellowships are really cool because some you get paid for, though the two I did, I, I, I was received a stipend and you get to get some really good spurt on the site experience in public health. And then you get to get out of there and learn something new. Um, so I love it. And I think it's just another way of, increasing my network pool and getting everything that I was seeking out to get. Thank you for walking us through that. And yeah, you definitely continue to build on the experiences and wanted to continue to grow, to build yourself. And that's awesome that you're able to get both into the DRPH program as well as a director position, pretty like simultaneously or like close together and continue to build, build that. And the question I did have was around the doctor of public health uh, and you're a doctor of public health health at the University of Georgia. What was that thought process or the impetus for you wanting to choose to be to get a DRPH and maybe like opposed to a PhD? So I understood the difference between the two. I knew that with PhD, it was high quality research and engaging in an actual thesis to come out as an academic scholar to instill knowledge either in an academic setting or industry. Um, It was going to be very research heavy. And DRPH is more of an applicable practice where you are applying the leadership skills in the doctorate program in an industry setting, most likely. It's not necessarily always geared toward an academic scholarship setting as the PhD is. The PhD trains you in the route of research, publications, academic scholarship, professorship, right? That's the that's the angle of a PhD. Now, people do a lot with their PhDs that don't always look like that, but that's the training that they're stealing is that research dense work. I was tired of research. <laughs> I've been researching as a big mayor since 21. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna need a little something else. Um, and and with the DRPH, I like the flexibility of either or because I loved teaching, but I didn't necessarily want to be the cranker of publications and new knowledge, not on a yearly basis, like when I'm inclined to, sure, but I want the flexibility of publishing when I feel, researching when I feel, teaching when I feel. Like I said, my personality needed fluidity and flexibility. And I feel like the DRPH gave me that. Um, The DRPH is designed for leadership executives who want to enter into those leadership senior level higher positions through that applicable experience, experience that the public health degree gives you. Like I said, that's the training. Now, what you do with it, people do an array of things, but the training is different for the PhD and the DRPH. And so I feel like the training I would get as a leader in public health through the DRPH program was more fitting for me than the academic research training of a PhD. So the DRPH was just a good fit. And so um, I knew I needed to stay in Atlanta because I was a working girl too. And the more responsibilities I had, I realized I couldn't just be a full-time student. That just wasn't realistic for me. I wanted to still work. And so DRPH program was also optimal because it was for working professionals. They designed the program to where we can take evening classes two times a week. 
and still be able to perform in our professional worlds as well as a school. So um, it was just a good fit all around. Um, the University of Georgia also had um, a pretty good uh, uh, cost in tuition and also some great professors. And for me, I wanted to uh, work alongside people who were at the Fanning Institute, which is a leader in leadership institute at the University of Georgia, where they actually developed leadership workshops for working professionals in public health. And I was like, oh, I love working with leaders in public health. I love developing workshops and having that creative space for me. So all those pieces made sense. So the DRPH was just the best option for me. And I felt like even now uh, in my second year, I'm still gaining a lot. And it's um, it's just been a really good uh, way for me to use the skills that I'm learning in public health and DRPH program, optimize those skills in my professional space at the American Heart Association, and also um, using those skills that I will be uh, using in my new uh regional director summer position that I'll take um, working alongside some fellows that I worked with last year as a fellow. Now I'm working as a regional director. So that was just a really good synergy. Um, But like I said, high achiever. It's just what I do. (laughs) And and that that aligns a lot with what I've heard a lot of other people talk about when they're thinking about getting a DRP, which is a PhD, and absolutely understand, like, just wanted to be more on that practitioner side as opposed to, like, researching something and having more control of this, the... Uh, I don't want to say like the, the outputs that you get from from being able to, to to practice more so than just like researching something more specific. Um, and then I, I don't know if you did, but can you touch more on what you do as a community impact director at the American Heart Association? Sure. So um, my day to day work involves connectivity. So I am a connector of working alongside clinic clinic. Um, health clinics in Atlanta, and also community organizations in Atlanta. So with the American Heart Association, our three priority areas in Metro Atlanta are nutrition security, blood pressure management, hypertension control, and tobacco um, and vaping prevention. So under these three priority areas, I work with clinics and I work with community organizations to move their priorities forward alongside the priorities that we have. And we provide the policy structures and the resources for them to move their priorities forward. So for example, you have a clinic and they have hypertensive patients. They wanna serve them, they're doing all the work to serve them, but maybe they need more structure in how they're actually planning and understanding their, their treatment plans and how they want to get most of their patients under control when it comes to their hypertension. They might need some resources, some education, some training. They might need a policy that helps them move that process forward. AHA provides that for those clinics. Um, In the community space, same thing. Let's just say you have a community organization that wants to provide healthy food for the community, but maybe they need some resources. Maybe they need to train their staff on how to actually make sure that they're um, serving healthy meals. Maybe they need um, some support on how to build a policy, a healthy food policy that all the organization staff can use when they're actually purchasing food. So all those different mechanics of what organizations or clinics need to fill their priorities, AHA has the capacity to help them. And so my job is to provide the technical assistance and support to make sure that whatever priorities a clinic or an organization has, we can use the resources we have at AHA to help them meet their needs. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And I I love, I I love that, um, like building on everything you're talking about, like being a relationship builder earlier on and how that has played into like you being this connector here and being someone that supports the capacity and technical assistance for different organizations in trying to help them achieve their goal and in so helping the AHA achieve uh, its goal as well. And then 
in in understanding that you want to be a high achiever and everything like that, where would you like to see yourself in the future? Ah, what a question, Omari. What a question. Um, I want to see myself doing all the things that make me happy in my career. I think that's the best way to describe it. Because I can't tell you a certain organization. I can't tell you a certain salary. I just know that I want to love my job. I want to continue to climb in my career. I want to teach as a professor, um, probably adjunct though, because I don't, I don't want the commitment of <laughs> a full professorship, probably may, maybe assistant professor, because I know that they have a little more flexibility. Like I said, we love flexibility over here. Um, so probably an assistant professor while working at a health organization of some kind. Um, I love doing policy work. So I want to stay in that space of working in systems change opportunities. Um, and I also want to do a lot on my own, like um, podcasting. I love talking, as you can probably tell from uh, our time together. And I really do want to continue to pick brains and understand people's journeys and movements in public health and really talk to professionals about what their why is and what they see public health moving in the next generation and how we can be prepared for that. Um, I want to consult and I want to build out strategies and help people um, be their best selves as public health professionals. Um, I want to give them the tools that I've used and, and really help them build and climb the ways that I did. And I want to also enjoy everything outside of public health, which is my, my, my own personal health and strength and my self-care, uh, my family, my partner, my my friends um and just love the life that i live each day so i think with all that being said the sky is literally the limit i i'm i'm confident that wherever i end up um in the next 10 years it's going to be somewhere where my name is in somebody's some something <laughs> and my name is already in a, in a couple of things already so i'm excited to see where my name ends up in the next 10 years I appreciate that. And I think like having that open mind to really seeing where it can take you and just focusing more on the values of the job that you want to do and uh, doesn't really like limit you and it allows you to, to like pivot as we've been talking about and really figure out where where you ideally see yourself and allows you to a lot of potential. And as you, as we've heard throughout this this episode, you've really built on experiences and different things like that so that you can better understand um, and moving us on to the last section of the show, the Furious Five, the five questions that I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student to try to pursue a career in public health? Be open, receive, and believe that you can thrive in the field. Don't be limited by other people's experiences, but create your own. Love that. Love that. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Ooh, be a lion. Like, attack. Attack what you want to do. Um, and be confident in knowing that you belong in spaces that you probably wouldn't perceive yourself to belong in. Um, director always sounded so far from far removed from what I could ever do, but I'm here in this space and I know that it's going to be upward and onward and I'm excited. So be a lion and, and attack and know that you belong in those spaces. I appreciate that. And I don't think everyone, anyone has ad, ever said that uh, or made like an animal analogy on the show before. So I appreciate that too. Um, number three. What's something you're working on improving in your life right now? Something that I'm improving in my life right now? Yeah, working to improve. Um, my procrastination. <laughs> so here's the thing, y'all. Being a high achiever also means that it's like, you know, I could do this the day before it's due because I know I'm good at doing things the day before it's due, but is it healthy? No, it's not. Um, so... <laughs> 
I'm a whiz at time management, but I know I can be better, especially when it comes to organizing my priorities and being better at not procrastinating. But I think I'm not alone in that, which is good. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's real for for many of us, especially high achieving people as well. Um, um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, and I hope you're able to overcome that. <laughs> Number four. <laughs> Number four. Professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, professionally, I recommend to not be intimidated by networking. I know it sounds very surfaced. Like, oh, I got to say hi. How are you? All this small talk. Ugh. It doesn't have to be that scary. And I've had to tell myself that even recently. Like I've I've fallen into a pit of like network overload where it's like, oh, I'm so tired of networking because I've been doing it all my life. You know, like I even fall into the pit of exhaustion with networking. But I have to remember that it's it's because of gaining and receiving. So I'm gaining knowledge, I'm receiving knowledge, but I'm also giving too. So if I walk in spaces and I want to network, I don't just start with, hey, oh my God, here's my resume. I really want to work. I'm really excited. Oh my God, oh my God. It's more so like normal conversation. Like, hey, you know, um, how are you? What brings you to this space? What are you looking to do in this space? Um, if they say the same things, I'm like, oh, I'm here to network and gain knowledge too. Okay, where do you work? Oh, wow, I work in the same. Okay, okay. Uh, what's your strengths? What are you really good at doing in this in, in in public health? Oh, really? Me too. And so it becomes a thing where the small talk becomes real talk. It becomes something where you find synergy with other people and um, there's a sense of belonging. So networking isn't as intimidating as it seems. But it is intimidating, but it's not as intimidating as it seems. Um, but it's something that's necessary because you can have the 4.0s and all the degrees, but I'm telling you, no one's going to ask about your GPA when you walk into these spaces. They want to know who you are, what you do well, and how you can contribute to the work. And so if you can communicate those three things, high GPA or not, you're going to be just fine. Love that, love that. You know, that is that's is too true, too true in, in so many aspects. And then number five, last but not least, where can people connect with you, Christy? Oh, yes. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, Christy Sproul, K-R-I-S-T-I-S-P-R-O-W-L. That's the best space to connect with me. Um, I am on Facebook, but I'm probably going to deactivate soon and kind of reinvent my brand um, because all the high school foolishness that carries into like, I'm 30 now. I gotta, I gotta reset. <laughs> so, <laughs> and same for my Instagram. My Instagram is cause she is the truth. C A U S E. She is the truth, but I plan on reinventing again and getting a new Instagram account. That's really branding myself around health and wellness. And so um, if you follow my cause she is the truth account, I will post, my new branding opportunity on that account. And so you all can follow me once I figure out what that branding looks like. But um, at least so far, Christy Sproul on Facebook, Christy Sproul on LinkedIn, and Cuz She Is The Truth on Instagram. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Christy, for, for sharing all your insights and your story and your path. And I know it's definitely going to be helpful for someone out there. So I appreciate that. Yes. And, and please all, um, I, I am a resource. I am your new public health bestie. So, um, LinkedIn, please message me, connect with me. Um, I'm even open to email. Please email me. My email is christysproul.com. So that's K-R-I-S-T-I-S-P-R-O-W-L at Gmail. Please email me questions, comments, you're dope. Let's go for coffee. Any Anything in between. I'm open to all of those things. And I really hope to connect with public health geeks like myself. Yeah, absolutely. When you connect with Christy from the podcast, let her know that you heard about her from public health careers. 
housekeeping items everyone thank you all so much for watching be sure to subscribe if you have not leave a like leave a review and uh, share it with a friend it really helps to get out to more people appreciate you all and see you all for the next week